This is Game Night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Now, live from the Matt Black Kia Studios. Oh, what a oh, whoa, what a move. Here's Josh Hennig. Day after another Eagles embarrassing offensive performance, the defense played well, but the offense did a little bit of nothing. Game night here on 97.3 ESPN leading you up to college basketball at 7 o'clock. The Champions Classic on ESPN Radio. We got a lot of Eagles NFL to get to first this hour. We're moving Dave Weinberg back a day. We usually do a Weinberg Wednesday here on game night on Wednesdays. But we're having him on a Tuesday for a little day after Eagles reaction along with a little look at the Eagles season as we're going to have a busy day tomorrow. The Ravens and the Steelers game will be tomorrow on 97.3 ESPN. Kickoff at 340. Of course, I'll be leading into the Jimmy V College Basketball Classic. So we got college basketball today and tomorrow night. But after that Eagles game yesterday, a lot of people are reacting. You can keep reacting at 609-403-0973 on the PlaySugarHouse.com. Text board 609-403-0973. In very modest Eagles news, the Eagles cut Will Parks. And they released Shreve Miller off the practice squad because the defense was so at fault for that horrible loss yesterday. And that really starts where we need to start off. In the midst of all of this chaos, this horrible offensive performance all season long, the Eagles still don't get it. Now, whether they are willfully just don't care what anybody thinks, or if they're just completely oblivious to what's going on in the real world outside of the Eagles bubble that they've placed themselves in psychologically, emotionally, mentally, You still have a head coach who answers questions in a very awkward, as Mike Gill would say, unique, bizarre, whatever term you want to use, way. The Eagles still don't get the fact that when you perform offensively like that and your answer is constantly, I have to do a better job, I have to do a better job is not good enough. And that's one of the reasons why I want to, I'm looking forward to talking with Dave Weinberg coming up here in about 15 minutes because Dave Weinberg has covered the Eagles since the 90s. So he's seen the entire Jeffrey Laura, Jeffrey Laurie ownership era. And under Jeffrey Laurie, there's only been a handful of coaches. Doug Peterson, Chip Kelly, Andy Reid, Ray Rhodes. So whatever happens next is going to be a huge part of not just the Eagles' history, but the ownership's legacy. The owner, Jeffrey Lurie, has been very much a man of consistency. He has not been an overreactionary, emotionally-led individual. He's been a very smart, consistent businessman. And for the Philadelphia Eagles to not just have this poor of a season offensively, but to also have all these issues with the optics in public, it has to be frustrating somebody who holds himself to the high standards that Jeffrey Lurie holds himself. Mr. Lurie has always been an individual above reproach. He's never been considered by anyone in public or private a borderline psychopath like Dan Snyder. He's never been an egomaniac like Jerry Jones. He's never been somebody looking for a lot of public attention. He's never been somebody who's been an absentee owner like some NFL owners have been accused of, like Stephen Ross, for example, down with the Dolphins. Jeffrey Lurie, for the majority of his tenure as Eagles owner, has been everything you want from an owner. An owner who tries to not be overreactionary, an owner who tries not to be emotional, an owner who tries to do what's best for the franchise, best for the fan base, putting the best team on the field possible to win. His goal from the very beginning was to win a Super Bowl. And when the Eagles finally accomplished that, it felt like the organization was in the best place it ever been. But since they won the Super Bowl, the Eagles offense has gotten more and more problematic. 
despite having an offensive-minded head coach, despite having a quarterback drafted second overall, despite having the Super Bowl MVP also on the roster in 2018. And while some may say the Eagles were a dropped pass away from beating the Saints potentially a couple of years ago, there's no guarantee that they, even if you catch that pass, you're going to score on that drive or you're going to win that game. Furthermore, when the Eagles decided to move on from Nick Foles the next year, Carson Wentz had an up-and-down season. And for the second straight year, the team had a low point in November that they rebounded from. In 2018, it was the embarrassing Saints loss. In 2019, it was the Dolphins loss in Miami. And both times, the Eagles rebounded to have big playoff runs down the stretch to get into the postseason. And another what-if ending to the season. What if Carson Wentz was to get blasted in the back of the head by Davion Clowney? We'll never know. So coming into this year, there were expectations. There were promise. There was a belief that the roster was even better than last year. And none of that has been the case. And instead of the Eagles owning it, they seem to try to act like the problems either don't exist or they're not as serious as they really are. So when there are reports that come out that Jeffrey Lurie doesn't go to the Browns game, he storms out of practice, that he's instructing the organization to play Jalen Hurts, on one hand, there's a bit of an eye wrap raise saying, wow, this is, this is not what we're used to hearing and seeing. But on the flip side, you also have to realize that sometimes enough is enough. And as I'm watching that game last night, and I replayed the game this morning, because honestly, it was so late last night, I wasn't even sure if I was seeing what I was seeing. So I had to you know, try and just replay it back this morning on my television. And as I'm replaying the game back this morning on television, I still walk away with the same thing I saw the night before. That the entire offense is complicit in the problems for this team. And everybody wants to point the blame at one person or another. And I know on the television broadcast, you know, Brian Greasy was trying to blame the offensive line and the play calling because he's a quarterback. He protects quarterbacks. And Lou Riddick was blaming Howie Roseman because Lou Riddick wants to be an executive in the NFL. And he's trying to differentiate himself from a Super Bowl winning executive in Howie Roseman. So I understand that the broadcast definitely slanted some of people's perspectives out there. But at the end of the day, the reality is this. We also wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the owner. You see, the owner signed off on giving Carson Wentz that big contract. The owner signed off on bringing Doug Peterson in here to be head coach. The owner is the one who gave Roseman and Peterson matching extensions, tying them together. The owner is the one who, according to reports, wanted coaching staff changes to get rid of guys like Mike Rowe and to bring in Scangarello and Morningweg. The owner is where the buck stops with the Philadelphia Eagles. There's reports that there was a lot of dissension in the Eagles draft room about drafting J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. It's been suggested by some that Howie Roseman didn't want J.J. Arthago Whiteside and that other people in the room did. It has been suggested by some that while Doug Peterson and Jeffrey Lurie wanted Carson Wentz, there were others in the organization that weren't as enamored with him when they were doing the draft process back in 2016. And with all that being said, earlier today on the Sports Bash, John Clayton drops this little nugget all in all of us here on 97.3 ESPN. I mean, that's going to be the difficult thing that, you know, certainly that Jeff Lurie has to start to decide because if he's going to make a change, is it better? Because the one thing that is going to be tough for him is that if you let Howie go, I mean, you know, Howie kind of runs the show both on the financial side and also the personnel side, but they're, they've, they've done a terrible job as far as drafting wide receivers you know, and certainly, you know, letting, because I mean, I was even hearing last week that there's been internal riffs about Jefferson versus Rieger with some wanting uh, Jefferson and Jefferson right now being one of the best rookies in the league this year. And, you know, Rieger just 
starting to come around, but not doing well. So the two takeaways there are, number one, there was division about Jefferson and Rieger. Again, that's two straight draft years that there is dissension in the room about the wide receivers. Guess who was not in the room this year? Joe Douglas. So who was the dissension between? Was it the GM? Was it the scouts? Was it the owner? Was it the head coach? So at what point does the owner have to turn to his organization and say, something is wrong here. I have to make adjustments. I don't know the right answer for that personally. But here's what I do know. I think that every team has a bad year. Every organization can have a down year. And just because this year has gone horribly sideways doesn't mean that Howie Roseman is a horrible GM. It doesn't mean that Doug Peterson is a bad offensive mind or a bad head coach. But maybe there are tweaks and adjustments that need to be made to maximize both of them to make them better. Because whether people want to admit it or not, Howie Roseman was the quote-unquote man in charge when they drafted Dallas Goddard and Miles Sanders in the second round. Doug Peterson was the offensive play caller every year since he became head coach. And one of those years, Carson Wentz had a 68% completion percentage. And another year, he was among the NFL leaders in comeback, fourth quarter comeback wins. Now, Carson Wentz and his issues and his indecisiveness, his refusal to scan the field before he throws, his zeroing on a certain side of the field, his inability to admit that he is making mistakes, his stubbornness, his pride, his ego. These are all problems. But you know who else has stubbornness and pride and ego? It's Doug Peterson. So it's hard for me to sit here and say who's more at fault between Peterson and Wentz because I have trouble discerning where the rubber meets the road, to use that saying. It's hard for me to tell what aspect of the problem is Doug Peterson's game planning and play calling and what is Carson Wentz's translation and interpretation and ability to do his job. Because there's many times that Wentz doesn't look like he knows what he's doing at all back there. So as I said earlier, the ball is in one person's court right now. It's the owner. Because I'll tell you one thing that happened last night. The defense did everything they could. DK Metcalf is a beast. He's a monster, physically. And he's bigger and stronger than almost every cornerback in the NFL, including Darius Slay. There were multiple times Darius Slay played the play perfectly, and DK Metcalf just was the bigger and better athlete. 609-403. 0973 the place sugarhouse.com text board 609 403 0973. Joey D and Ventner chimes in. We'll get to that text right now. 609 403 0973. Before we get the break, Dave Weinberg joins us a day early here on Game I talk more about the Eagles game and the state of the franchise as they are now not just guaranteed to have a losing record, but on track to miss the postseason for the first time since 2016. Joey D. and Mentor chimes in says, Carson Wentz is not seeing open receivers regardless of if he has time or not. It's also frustrating with Doug's suspect fourth down and two-point conversion percentage backfiring. Well, Joey, a couple things. First of all, I have more of an issue with Doug's going for and fourth down and his obsession with two-point conversions than I have with anything else of his play calling. I don't I don't understand why he refuses to kick. It's almost like he's taking the criticism of when he didn't kick the ball. I mean, sorry, when he did kick the ball instead of going for it on fourth down earlier in the year against the Bengals to an extreme. It's like he's saying, oh, I punted the ball at one time. Well, I was criticized for that, so I'm going to go for it every fourth down I possibly can. 
And then the two point conversion thing. I don't know. Is that is that a Doug Peterson thing or is that an analytics thing? Because I know that a lot of the analytics say you should go for two point conversions X number of times, and these organizations have this whole chart lay out this Excel spreadsheet saying if it's at this point in the game with this much time on the clock, with the score being this, you should go for a two point conversion here, right? So the two point conversion thing again. Another example of who do I blame? Who do I point the finger at? And you're right about Carson Wentz. He's not seeing open receivers, Joey D. It's completely exasperating. And Brian Greasy can blame the offensive line all he wants. But I thought Wentz was supposed to have a high football IQ. I was told, I was informed by every draft analyst from ESPN to NFL Network to CBS Sports to Fox Sports, that Carson Wentz had one of the best football IQs of any quarterback coming out of college in the last eight years. That he was supposedly the best football intelligence since Andrew Luck, okay? So Carson Wentz, who's now in his fifth year in the NFL, is supposed to be so smart. Why can't he figure some of this stuff out? Why can't he say... The blitz is coming at me hard. I should just dump it off. I should do a check down. I should option out of this pass play and go with the run play. Why can't Carson Wentz figure some of this out, stuff out on his own? Why does he need someone to hold his hand? You know, Doug Peterson mentioned, oh, we might have to simplify the offense more. Why? You're basically telling me that Carson Wentz isn't smart enough or capable enough to do the job anymore. That's scary. A lot of stuff to sift through. Game night here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hennig hanging out with you. Coming up next, Dave Weinberg. Get your extra point columns over at 97.3 ESPN.com. Longtime Eagles beat writer will join us next here on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. You're listening to Game Night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Josh Hennig here on Game Night here on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get to your text messages more in just a bit at 609-403-0973. But as promised, joining me right now on the boardwalk on a hotline. Usually hear him on a Wednesday, but he was kind enough to move back to a Tuesday. Dave Weinberg, veteran Eagles Writer, covered the Eagles in South Jersey sports for many years. You can follow him on Twitter at Dave Weinberg19. Check out his extra point columns over at 973ESPN.com. As all guests, he joins us on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Dave, how are you doing this Tuesday? Uh, doing better than the Eagles, but I'm okay. <laughs> well, considering the according to your extra point columns, the weekend that you had leading into the Eagles game. Uh, it definitely has not been uh, without any uh, excitement, to say the least, shall I say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was playing golf on Saturday morning, and uh, I always walked the course with a push cart and uh, uh, went to the fourth hole, uh, turned, went to, actually, I hit my shot into the water, went to pick it out, and then uh, turned around on my golf cart, rolled into the pond, dumping all my coffee mug, my nine iron, everything else into the, into the drink. So it's been like 15 minutes fishing everything out. <laughs> So, speaking of the Eagles last night, it's, it's amazing to me. That's where I want to start with Dave, because I know everyone wants to focus on Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson, blah, blah, blah. But I want to start with the owner, because you and I talked about this a little bit last week. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey Lurie has never been a reactionary, emotional owner. He's not the, the Jerry Jones, Dan Snyder type. He's not one of these guys who's out there looking for attention. He's always been a very patient, thoughtful man. You know, and you've covered the Eagles the entirety of the Jeffrey Lurie era as owning the Eagles. Yes. You know, I got to think Jeffrey Lurie, despite all the success he's had with the Eagles since he took over the ownership, this has got to be the strangest situation he's ever been in owning this team. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, you can go back to, let's say, uh, you know, Rich Kotite. He knew that um, he pretty much knew that he was going to get rid of Rich, you know, after uh, when, after his first season there as the owner. Um, Rich just didn't fit into uh, what he was, you know, thinking as the future of the franchise. 
Uh, and the other, the other coaches kind of just like either overstayed their welcome or just didn't, didn't, um, didn't have the success that, that Jeffrey, you know, expects. He expects the Eagles to be one of those elite franchises in the NFL. And when you don't meet those expectations, um, he's disappointed. This year, though, you're right. It's been a very strange uh, up and down, topsy turvy kind of season for the whole league with the COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, and the Eagles, in particular, with injuries up and down the line, the offensive line being decimated. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's frustrated. I, I have no doubt about that. But I think he might also. Um, be willing to not not willing to accept it, but I think he understands uh, the extenuating circumstances revolving some, revolving some of the stuff. We know the Eagles of the past have not exactly been afraid to make changes when they felt it was absolutely necessary. But mm-hmm. right. it's it's hard though to make changes in the situation because I know people are calling. You know, some people are saying fire Doug Peters. Some people are saying fire fire Howie Roseman, but. You don't win a Super Bowl by accident, David. It's to me, winning a Super Bowl is one of the hardest things to do in professional sports. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, the you know, it's always the uh, you know social media or uh, fans on you know trolling different sites, and uh, you know, every and I understand everybody's frustrated and disappointed and angry even over the way the team has played this year. But um, Jeffrey's not normally like that. He he's a wait and see kind of guy. I mean, he's not one to to fly off the handle. I mean, there were some reports that he skipped the Browns game for the first time in forever because uh, he was so disgusted. But um, you know, later he he suggested here he told he told people through the team that he was just uh, trying to stay safe because he was going. He wanted to go to his mom's for Thanksgiving, which is certainly understandable in these in these trying times. So, but yeah, he's not a. Um, He's not a reactionary kind of guy, like you said. He's not a uh, Daniel Snyder. He's not a uh, uh, Arthur Blank. Uh, you know, some of the other guys that are always seeking the limelight. He he pretty much stays in the background and uh, lets his feelings be known after the season. I mean, now's not the time to, to make those kind of rash changes that people are wanting to make. When you're watching the offense, Dave, and I know everybody wants this question answered specifically, but it's a question that I have trouble answering because to me it's, you know, it's a very, you know, chicken or the egg kind of question. But who is to blame more for the offensive struggles? Is it Doug Peterson, the play caller, or is it Carson Wentz, the offensive executioner? Man, that's a tough call, Josh. Um, uh... I think it's probably like 50-50, maybe 60-40 on Wentz. Um, you know, I know Doug, Doug has not had the best season, that's for sure, in terms of decision-making, play calling, uh, you know, challenges or whatever. I mean, the, you know, going forward on fourth down, going for, going for two when it makes him sense. Um, just, um, you know, he's, he's, been, he's, he's, had, he's been a disappointment as well. But I, I just – the regression that Carson Wentz has made uh, – I think that supersedes uh, the stuff the stuff that Doug has gone through. I mean, he just um, it just amazes me that you know the the troubles that he's had, you know, three high fifteen interceptions. Although uh, you know the one last night certainly wasn't his fault, uh, but um, just a, he just does he's not the same quarterback that he was a few years ago. And I'm, uh, you know we've talked about this you know ad nauseum, but I just don't know that he ever will. The first thing they need to do is get a quarterbacks coach and or offensive coordinator that is not his buddy. Uh, that will actually, you know, tell him, read him the riot act when necessary, um, get him to make the changes that need to be made rather than, you know, palling up to the guy like I think um, Press Taylor might be doing. Dave Weinberg joining us here on Game Day on 97.3 ESPN. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Dave Weinberg 19. Check his extra point columns at 97.3 ESPN.com. Dave, I'm glad you brought up the Press Taylor thing because – I've I've been wondering for a while what the deal is with this guy because he was a holdover from the Chip Kelly era, so he was never even a Peterson hire. He's the guy who's kind of just like hung around and hung around and almost gotten promotions just because he was the last man standing in some situations. And it feels like what is this guy doing? Like is is he really helping this team be better? And to me. Like you said, I can't have my quarterback coach being best friends with the quarterback. I need my quarterback coach to have a bit of professional separation to be able to go look at the quarterback when he's showing him the the Microsoft pad on the sideline and say, dude, why did you keep your head left and never look right when there's a guy wide open right? 
Or why did you not throw the check down and then get sacked or throwing the, holding the ball for four seconds? I feel like he's just having the, a casual day at the park conversations with Wentz. On the, I'm not saying he should be screaming and yelling at him on the island, but there's, there's a level of too much, shall I say, laissez-faire when it comes to their interactions. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong there, Josh. I, I kind of think that, Doug, I know it'd be difficult, it's awfully difficult being the head coach, but I think he might want to start making more, taking more of an ownership role in that quarterback room when he can. I mean, Doug played the position for a long, long time, uh, been an offensive coordinator, been a position coach. Um, he knows what it takes to, to fill that role, and I think that uh, I know that, that Carson certainly respects him and his viewpoint, so maybe it's going to take Doug to have a more uh, – like I said, a, a, bit, a larger role when it comes to the coaching the quarterback, although that's going to be tough, you know, at the expense of the rest of the, the team. But there's clearly a disconnect between him and Press that uh, just doesn't seem to be um, fixable at this point. And I think Doug might, I, I think he might be the one that would that would be able to uh, at least, you know, drill some sense in, in the Carson and get him to understand the mistakes that he's, that he's making are, are, uh, are, are fixable. Yeah, and also let's not forget that, you know, there, there might just be too many people in that room, too. I mean, between yeah, Taylor and true. Scangarello and Morningweg and they brought Aaron Moorhead, the wide receiver coach, and uh, Briner, who worked in college for a while. He's now a uh, passing assistant. Like, there's like 200 people in the offensive room. Maybe at some point That's true. You, need, you, you need to thin out the room and maybe you only have one other person or two other people in the room talking to Wentz. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I would I would assume the quarterbacks are meet separately, and in that in that if that's the case, then they should be, uh, Doug. Like I said, maybe uh, expressing his uh, opinion on things. But yeah, I mean, they Doug didn't want to fire the guys that he fired. He was kind of forced into it. Uh, you know, he he endorsed them at the end of the last year, and um, Roseman and Laurie, I guess, were the ones that kind of thought otherwise. And you know, next thing you know, they're hiring all these consultants and. You know, uh, assistant. I guess assistant to the assistant. Um, you know, just uh, guys are really. Oh my gosh, I mean, Dave! I mean, everyone I, has an assistant. I mean, the assistants have assistant. It's like, come on. <laughs> I mean, tell me what a. Excuse me. Tell me what a quality control control coach does, because I'd love to know. I want to know what the assistant to the quality control coach does. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's, uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it really is. I mean, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to advocate for people being fired left and right, but there's a point in time where it's like, you know, less is more, you know, and, and I, I don't know, it might not be the best example, but, you know, in college, a college that you are very affect, have affection for, Arizona State, Herm Edwards, I think, has one of the best staffs in, in college football. And, yep, it's, and it's lesser than most staffs. While James Franklin has like 50 dudes on his coaching staff, Herm has only a handful of guys. And his whole thing is, there's only a handful of us. We all have to work together with the players. It's on all of us to make these players better players and better men. And, you know, that's his whole mantra. And to me, you know, maybe that can't be perfectly replicated at every level, but I think there's something to be said for that. Yeah, I mean, Herm's kind of, well, I guess, like an old school kind of guy, having been in the NFL, you know, as a player and as a head coach. Uh, Marvin Lewis is on his staff, and... You know, another guy who's been around the uh, been around the you know the the field a few years, and uh, yeah, this is I think it is a situation where less is more. I mean, the the fewer voices you have in a guy's head, I think the better off you're going to be. I mean, that's that's true at every level, high school, college, and uh, even in the NFL. Like you said, there there are assistants to the assistants, and guys who are quality control coaches and video coordinators, and you know, quarterbacks coach and assistant quarterbacks coach. It's just uh, there's just too many. Um, too many voices there for, and I think it gets to the point where a player doesn't really know who to listen to. Um, you know, one guy's offering one thing, the other guy's offering another opinion, and it's, uh, it gets really confusing for those guys, I think. Dave, I'd be remiss if we didn't touch on something that I think a lot of people won't spend a lot of time talking about, which is overall, outside of a handful of plays throughout the game, the Eagles' defense actually did their job again for the most part. You know, last week they only allowed 13 points to the Browns. This week it was just Darius Slay getting out physical by, by a monster human being. But otherwise they got sacks. They were getting pressure. They were getting stops in the backfield. They were slowing down a Seahawks running game that t typically runs on other teams. So 
it seems like at least for the last few weeks since the bye week, the Eagles defense for the most part is doing their job. Yeah, I thought they did. I mean, they, they came up big in there, early, especially early in the game with Derek Barnett getting the pair of those, uh, those, getting those forced down stops that seemed to eject a little bit of uh, energy and enthusiasm into the unit. Um, but it just seemed to me, though, like when the, Se- uh, when the Seahawks really needed to make a play, they made it. Um, you know, you paid Darius Slay a lot of money uh, to be at the so-called lockdown corner. And, you know, he was the first one to admit that he, had, he probably had the worst game of his eight-year career last night. Um, but you just, I mean, he, D, DK Metcalf just owned him. I mean, it was just, uh, whenever they needed to play, you know, that they, they went to him and he always delivered and Darius was really powerless to stop it. Now, maybe Jim Schwartz could have maybe helped out with a safety over the top and that might've, uh, maybe calmed some things down, but, uh, yeah, I mean, overall they did a, they did a solid job, but, um, uh, that's another unit that, that really needs to improve also though. I think they all think they only had two sacks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they had a couple of sacks, but they I think I think it was like six or eight quarterback hits. I mean, they were they were at least getting pressure on the quarterback. And to me, that's yeah, that's right. you know, the big part of Schwartz's defense has always been is he getting pressure on the quarterback? Is are they getting to the quarterback? And I feel like since the bye week, for the most part, the defense has showed up where the offense hasn't. And I think that, you know, for as much as we criticize Doug Peterson and Carson Wentz, we've got to give some credit to the defense for the last couple of weeks, at least sure. in some ways, because at least they're trying to win the game, whereas the offense looks dazed and confused. Yeah, I mean, there, there were, uh, earlier in their year, there were times when the defense really let them down. Now it's the offense that's doing it. It's, um, and, and good teams, like legitimate playoff contenders, they're, willing, they're able to get every segment, offense, defense, special teams, coaching, working in unison, and, and everybody doing their job. And that's just not... That's just not the case uh, with the Eagles at this point. And, you know, I, I fr- frankly, I don't see them winning another game the rest of the year. I mean, maybe they can beat the Cowboys. I don't know. But uh, if Andy Dalton's back there, uh, I doubt it. All right, so, so what you're saying is the Eagles are not going to win any more than three or four games this season. Correct. So if that is what happens... What do you think is going to happen this offseason? Because I, I just, I doubt that they would let nothing happen at all. Like some, someone's got to be moved or changed or fired or, or traded or something, right? You would think so, yeah. I mean, I just don't, I don't know how much weight Jeffrey gives to the, um, to the, all the offseason stuff. You know, the lack of the uh, mini camps, the lack of uh, offseason, the lack of preseason games, of uh, face-to-face meetings. But again, every team went through the same thing, and not everybody struggled like they have. Um, I'm personally, I'm not firing Doug Peterson. Uh, I think he's too good of a coach. Um, I think Howie Roseman, on the other hand, might um, it might be time for a change uh, at that level. Maybe bring in somebody else. Um, he hasn't been the best uh, um, the best guy on draft day, obviously, and. Um, I think aside, if they're going to make a change, I think it might be more in the front office than on the sideline. I guess, at least that's what I would do, but, you know, who knows? I would fire Press Taylor and see who screams first, then fire that person. That's what I would do. <laughs> there you go. By find, find out who Press Taylor's best friend is in the organization. Get rid of that person. That's where I would, <laughs> that's where I would start. I just I don't understand. Like, I understood Deuce Stanley being held over because he's, he's an eagle lifer, right? But, like... Right. Who, who the heck is Press Taylor? Why does that guy get to hang on from Chip Kelly's, uh, Chip Kelly's, you know, coaching staff? It just seems so odd to me. I want to know whose idea that was. I want to fire that person too. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I think he's, there's a few guys. It's just Stoutlin, I believe, is a holdover, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I could be wrong. Right, but, but Stout, um, Stoutlin's one of the most respective offensive line coaches in the doggone lead. Right. Who the heck is oh, Press absolutely. Taylor? I'm not arguing with you. I'm not arguing with you at all. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm I think a, Press uh, Taylor's I'm my age, it. actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand it, but uh, I guess they, they have their reasons, for whatever they are. But you're right, there has to be, there definitely have to be some changes in, in the in the coaching staff or uh, front office, if you will, after the season. They can't just get going with the with the status quo. That's not going to work. Yeah, he's Dave Weinberg. You can follow him on Twitter at Dave Weinberg19. Check out his extra point columns at 973ESPN.com. Also, you can check out his podcast. Of course, that would be Tequila and Touchdowns with Dave Weinberg. And he joins us usually each week. 
for a Weinberg Wednesday. He'll be back on Wednesday next week, but we appreciate him jumping on a Tuesday for a day after reaction to the Eagles right here on 97.3 ESPN. Dave, always appreciate the time and the conversation. Oh, thanks, Josh. I got to keep drying out my golf cart. <laughs> Good luck. We're all counting on you. All right. See ya. <laughs> Josh Eddick here on game night on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get back to the text board next, 609-403-0973 on the playsugarhouse.com text board here on game night on 97.3 ESPN FM and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. Now, more game night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Josh Hennig here on game night on 97.3 ESPN. Don't forget, still to come, we have the Champions Classic doubleheader right here on 97.3 ESPN tonight. No game night tomorrow. We'll be having the Ravens versus Steelers kick off at 3.40 right here on 97.3 ESPN. You got myself and Hunter Brody covering for Mike Gale tomorrow from uh, 2 to about 3.30 something around then. We'll be hanging out with you. So about an hour and a half of the Sport Bash tomorrow. We'll get back to your text in just a moment, 609-403-0973. Seriously, I love someone to tell me what exactly earned Press Taylor his, uh, his elevated role. Thanks, Dave Weinberg, for jumping on a day early here on Game Night on 97.3 ESPN. Game Night, of course, being brought to you by WeightliftingHQ.com. Just because Cyber Monday and Black Friday are over doesn't mean that WeightliftingHQ.com is isn't still a great opportunity for you to get some incredibly great deals at affordable prices at weightliftinghq.com. They are located right here in South Jersey. They operate fully online, and they cater to weightlifters and health and fitness enthusiasts interested in working out from home. So whether your goals for 2021 require you to get a little extra workout time at the house or whether you're not ready to go back to the gym and you want a full workout regimen from home, well, with weightliftinghq.com, they got benches, squat racks, kettlebells, dumbbells, cardio and fitness machines, heart rate sensors, fitness watches, resistance bands, and more. And don't forget about their great local customer service with their equipment delivery services deliver it right to your home. They set it up for you. You cannot beat the customer service, the prices, and more with weightliftinghq.com. Use Radio 10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. That's Radio 10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order at weightliftinghq.com. 609-403-0973 in the playsugarhouse.com. Text board 609-403-0973. Shout out to the texter who uh, is enjoying the Stevie Wonder tunes I'm dropping. Try to mix it up. Try to, you know, get a little variety in here when it comes to the music. Little Stevie Wonder today, maybe a little through uh, what I do on Saturday. I had a uh, well hour one of the show on Saturday. I did Daddy Yankee. Hour two, no, hour one. I did Don Omar. Hour two, I did Daddy Yankee, and then uh, last week I did a little Pearl Jam. So I, I try to mix it up for you guys out there, keep you on your toes. So shout out to Texture who enjoyed the Stevie Wonder today. Uh, 609-403-0973, the Play Sugar House Text board, Dan EHT chimes in and says, I personally don't think Wentz is as bad as he's been. The rotating offensive line creates no rhythm. Wentz is about a top 15 quarterback. He reminds me of Eli Manning. Overall, in the future, I think he can be a very better, very top 15 quarterback, just not right now. A couple things. One, I think Wentz's potential has and always will be better than Eli Manning because Wentz didn't turn into this turnover machine, this guy who's constantly getting sacked until this year. You know, I was reading an article on ESPN Plus, and there were multiple NFL executives in this ESPN article who remained anonymous, obviously, who said, you know, to Dan Graziano and others at ESPN that they believe Carson Wentz still has talent. They believe Carson Wentz still has ability, but that he either needs to be in a different offense or needs a different coach or Something has to change for Wentz to get him out of this rut. And, look, I'm not sitting here and telling you that Carson Wentz is a lost cause, that he's the worst quarterback in Eagles history. 
I'm not going to do any of that because it's unfair, it's intellectually dishonest, and it's irrational because I know that all of us have seen Carson Wentz play very well. You know, the Houdini act, the big throws, the, the throwing in the small windows, the touch on the pass, the just the power in his arm. I mean, he's a big, strong kid. You know he's capable of playing quarterback. But when he makes the decisions he does like he did last night, for example, the, the Goddard interception bothered me because I've watched it twice now. And I understand people are saying, well, Goddard went the wrong way. It was a miscommunication, blah, blah, blah. Somebody, somewhere needs to figure out that Wentz's anticipation ability right now is not on par with what is necessary to be a successful football team. I said it earlier in the show. Wentz is supposed to be this high football IQ, super intelligent, you know, very smart, et cetera guy. If you're so smart and you're so intelligent and you're so intellectually on the higher level when it comes to the game of football and you're constantly studying tape and you're, you know, the legendary stories of his girlfriend telling, telling him his now wife, telling him to get off of the iPad and get off the phone and stop studying tape and put the playbook away and, you know, unplug and blah, blah, blah. All these things. Why is he doing these things? There has to be a reason why he thinks it's okay to not move his head at all and scan the field at all post-snap. Or why pre-snap he's calling out the wrong protections. Or he's audibling into the wrong play. Or there has to be a reason why he's doing the things he's doing aside from just he's regressed. It's too simple and cheap to say that Wentz regressed and Doug is stupid, okay? That's basic simpleton thinking. There has to be a bigger explanation for why Doug Peterson is saying and believing what he says, because I don't think Doug is some, you know, guy who's a liar and a, and a manipulative individual. No, I think he generally believes that when he says that he takes pride in his play calling and he doesn't think it's necessary for him to give the play calling to anybody else right now. I don't think that he's, I don't think he's lying. I don't think that he's completely off his rocker. There has to be a reason why Doug thinks the way he does and Wentz thinks the way that he does that's leading them to be doing and making the decisions that they are. And whatever the source of that is, that is what has to be fixed. That's the person who needs to be fired. Whoever is putting the misinformation in Doug and Wentz's ear, that's who needs to be fired. I am not convinced for one minute that Press Taylor is the right man for this quarterback job. I don't care if him and Wentz are best friends. I don't care if they're at each other's weddings. I don't care if they hang out. I don't care if they go to church together. I do not care. Press Taylor is only the quarterback coach and passing game coordinator because he was the last man standing when Frank Reich left for the Colts head coaching job, when John D. Filippo left for the offensive coordinator job in Jacksonville, and when other people either were fired or let go along the way. As far as I'm concerned, whoever is giving Doug Peterson and Carson Wentz misinformation, along with Press Taylor, needs to go. I think that Wentz and Doug, for as ridiculous as they have been at times this year, are not being helped by their supporting cast. Wentz is not being helped by his offensive line at times. Wentz has been hurt by the information given to him, and so is Doug. And somebody needs to be fired. Somebody needs to be let go. Someone needs to be held up as the reason why this team is going so sideways. Because while on one hand, I am not advocating for Peterson or anyone to be fired, somebody is going to have to be held up as the reason for why this season went sideways. And I have a lot of trouble believing that Doug Peterson and Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles won a Super Bowl by accident. You know how many franchises have never won a Super Bowl? 
The Lions and the Browns never even been to the Super Bowl. Neither have the Texans, the Falcons, the Panthers, the Chargers. These franchises have never, ever, ever, the Vikings, never, ever, ever won a championship. And the Eagles have won a Super Bowl and have been the two others. The NFL is one of the hardest sports in all of professional sports of any variety to win a championship in. So I'm just supposed to believe the Eagles caught lightning in the bottle and just happened to accidentally win a championship that year? No. There has to be more to Doug Peterson and how he rose in that. Now, look, maybe we could have a discussion at some point about changing Howie's role or, you know, telling Doug that he needs to go and get a legitimate offense coordinator. I don't know what the answer is, but the answer is not Peterson is stupid, Howie Roseman is not a football guy, and Carson Wentz is a bust. Those are not answers. Those are emotional reactions to a situation that none of us have concise and clear answers for. Josh Hennick here on Game Night on 97.3 ESPN. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Josh Hennick. Hennick's about H-E-N-N-I-G. Of course, if you miss any of the Game Night podcasts, you catch it on the website, 97.3 ESPN.com. Each night, I'll be back behind the mic tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Filling in for Mike Gale as Hunter Burry and I will be with you from 2 to about 3.35. Leading you in the Ravens-Steelers right here on 97.3 ESPN.